Welcome to a new episode in the Multiverse video series. I'm Javier Luraski, and today we're going to introduce you to distributed computing. So before we get into what is distributed computing, I want to show you an example. So I'm sure you all have watched Moana. For generations, this peaceful island has been home to our family. But beyond our reef, a great danger is coming. Legend tells of a hero who will journey to find the demigod Maui. And together... However, what you might not have thought before of is how do you make those movies, right? And there's, there's a lot that comes into play when you're, you know, building a great movie like uh, Pixar's Moana. But, um, you know, it involves things like creating, you know, like mathematical models that can represent how the characters move and how the textures are rendered and why not. Uh, but it actually also is relevant to the topic that we're going to discuss today, which is distributed computing. So Moana is particularly interesting to me because uh, one of the great things that Walt Disney did was to open source one of the, their data sets. So actually, you can uh, you can go to their uh, you can come in their website, and I believe it's probably on their Animation Studios website, and they have like an open source kind of like section where they've made some of their models available. So if you look if you look at this particular model from the Moana Island, uh, you're gonna notice that it's about uh, uh, well, it's 45 gigabytes, a 45 giga, gigabyte download, and total is 93 gigabytes unpacked. So, so you can think that maybe it's not that much data, right? Like this fits on your computer, maybe. Uh, but, but what is really tricky is that in order to generate uh, this quality of images from their original data set that describes, you know, the mountain, the flowers, and the water, and why not, it actually requires a lot of compute power. So just to give you an idea of how much computing do you need to generate uh, 3D animated movies, um, there was there was a tweet from uh, Benedict Evans where where he explained that in 1995, um, when Pixar was making Toy Story, uh, basically the computers that they were using looked like this. And um, I remember reading somewhere that it took something like seven minutes in a closed in a cluster of computer computers to generate each frame in Toy Story. And again, this was a while ago, but um, to be fair, like the process has not changed. So that's so I guess what I'm trying to say is that when you're doing 3D rendering and high quality production productions, you, you basically can't really use a single computer to do your processing. You need multiple computers. You need to have, in this case, you know, hundreds or even thousands of computers working on a 3D model to actually render it properly and at the quality that you need for um, the theaters. Another example that I'm sure you're familiar with is Google, right? So whenever you search something in Google, for instance, we're just searching for Moana, right? Uh, basically, what Google has to do is they have to do, go all over the web and they have to find out what are the web pages that are relevant to you, right? And in this case, there's just, uh, well, apparently 300, 394 million pages related with Moana. So it's it's in this case, this case is a little bit different than Moana. The data by itself is huge. Uh, may, maybe the processing is not as intense as, you know, rendering a film like Moana, but still um, you, you can't do kind of like solve these problems with a single computer. So in fact, just to give you a sense of how much information there is on the web, uh, there is a report that I like from the World Bank. Uh, it's called uh, Enabling Digital Development, the data, Revo data Revolution. And basically in this report, the World Bank showed, um, showed um, is showing us how much digital information there is in the world, or at least, at least an, an approximation of how much information there is. Uh, the way that they split information in this report is by describing the data as either analog. This means, you know, paper, you know, like newspaper, books, paintings, and why not? And also digital information. You know, any, anything that lives on the web or on a hard drive would be considered digital. Um, and, and you can see that back in 1986, uh, we had about, you know, uh, 10 to the 16 bytes or close to an exabyte. 
um, you know, to make to make this more understandable, you can think you can think of a terabyte. Uh, well, first of all, like most of you might have that have a new computer, it's likely that you have a computer with a terabyte of information. A terabyte um, would be, well, first of all, a kilobyte would be 10 to the 3, followed by a megabyte 10 to the 6, followed by a gigabyte 10 to the 9, and a terabyte 10 to the 12. So in this case, in 1986, uh, we had 16 uh, minus 12, that's uh, 4, right? So we had about 10,000 hard drives or 10,000 in today's hard drives worth of digital information, which wasn't that much. But as you can see on this chart, basically, you know, the amount of digital information that we've been creating um, has been growing exponentially, right? And, you know, if you look at this around 2001, 2002, um, you can see here on the, on the graph that basically we had as much digital information as analog information. And today this just keeps growing, right? There is, um, you know, in terms of um, hard drives, like if we were to convert that 10 to the 12, a number, which would be a terabyte or about about the amount of storage that you have in your hard drive today, um, we would have to basically consider, um, you know, it's just tens of billions of hard drives that we would need to store all the information, which, you know, we happen to have. So, so this is a challenging problem, right? So when, whenever you search, a Google on Google or your, you know your search engine. What uh, for a particular term like someone needs to figure out how to compute all these information, and it's not possible to use a single machine. In fact, if we were to look at the original paper that uh, Sergey Brin and Larry uh, Larry Larry Page uh, submitted. Um, it's tight uh, when when they created Google. Uh, it's titled "The Anatomy of a Large-Scale Hypertextual Web Search Engine" from 1998, and they have a diagram somewhere in here that basically shows you how their architecture used to work, right? And again, this is a pretty old paper, but it gives you some sense on how you would have to structure something to process large amounts of information, right? So you can see here, for instance, in this case, that in order to create a search engine, or at least with, you know, pretty outdated technology, you know, you need some things like, um, you know, storing the web pages and you need to sort them, which is gonna be a topic that is relevant in this video, right? Um, it's not just enough to store the data. You also most likely need to sort it into something um, that is relevant to the results that you're displaying and why not? And, you know, you also have URLs and why not, right? So there's there were multiple components involved, but the point that I'm trying to make here is that the way that you solve the problem of searching data on the web requires more than one machine, right? It requires multiple machines. And similar to 3D rendering, um, when you're doing, when you're solving problems that are hard to solve with a single computer, using multiple computers is usually a reasonable approach to follow. So just to give you kind of like a quick look at how one of these first computers would look like, uh, I believe this is, you know, in, in the computer museum. And, you know, it just shows how, you know, these early Google servers would look like, right? It's, it's just a rack, um, which is basically just a group of computers working together. And they're just connected to high performance network. And, you know, each of them is just like a normal computer. It doesn't make sense to put a monitor on it because why would you need a monitor if you're using them all at the same time, right? Uh, so you use other tools to operate and run things over a group of computers. And again, this is a pretty small, small, you know, like cluster. Like usually, you know, you would use, you know, like to do to solve interesting problems, you might have to use not just 10 computers, but maybe hundreds, right? And you know, you would have a building full of computers that allows you to do processing. Now you don't need to have a building full of computers. You can also rent them. And that might be a topic for a different video, but you know, this gives you a sense of kind of like how things look like when you're working with distributed computing. And again, the original, the original diagram that I showed on um, Sergey's and Larry's page is, you know, it had, it, it had a bunch of systems that were interconnected and they were specialized, right? There was no particular system that was handling everything, right? Like they had a specialized systems doing things. Um, one interesting improvement 
on the space of distributed computing was what we call today MapReduce. Um, this was a paper from Jeff Dean and Sanjay that basically describes a better way of processing data that is distributed or that is hard to compute. And we call this process today MapReduce. And the way that it basically works is rather than having, rather than having specialized systems that say process URLs or are in charge of shuffling, you know, like finished renderings from a movie into different machines, uh, what we have is basically a common system that allows you to move data between machines and perform operations over them. And it's called MapReduce, and I'm hoping that in other videos we'll, we'll get into more details about it. But it's good to know that this was part of the, some of the steps that we took forward to get to a place where distributed computing is more accessible today. And in fact, there's, there's a lot of research and a lot of great advancements that have happened since, you know, like their early days of uh, computing. Um, I'm not going to get into too many details, but one of the other interesting systems that um, Google um, open sourced and that Grove wrote over under a research paper, um, I should read the title, uh, Large Scale Cluster Management at Borg, at Google with Borg. Um, it's basically this system that makes use of resources by being able to share the same computer and yet isolating their resources between different applications, right? So, so one thing that you don't want to happen is when you have a lot of computers that are doing work, if, if, all, the, if all the computers are doing the same type of work, like say you're doing, you know, you're doing a rendering of a movie or you're crawling the web and, or processing websites, it's not perhaps a big deal if one computer, you know, like crashes or why not. Um, you know, you have a lot of them and you usually can recover from these problems. Uh, but whenever you start reusing clusters to share data across different applications, so say one computer might be processing web page information and the same computer might be running your Google Docs, right? Or whatever. Um, so what you don't want to happen is, you know, like one, one application affecting the other one in ways that you would not want to do that. And um, this paper, uh, which are called, it's from Google and it's called um, Calls Out to Create Containers based on a lightweight wrapper around the operating system into something that Google ca calls pork, uh, porklet in this paper. But what is most, most interesting to mention is that today we know of this system as uh, Kubernetes. I'm pretty sure there is a reference on the paper to, uh, to Kubernetes, which, um, you know, just quoting the paper, Google's open source Kubernetes system, which is basically, uh, you know, was was inspired in in Borg, but it's actually its own its own thing today. And you might you might have heard of Kubernetes in the past, but it's just just good to know that kind of like what was the motivation behind it and how this kind of like fits in the in the ecosystem of distributed computing. If if you want. If, if you want to take a look at you know why containers are interesting and why Kubernetes is interesting in a simpler way, uh, this report from uh, CloudBeats I think does a pretty good job at showing why why containers are interesting. So in the past, uh, one of the things that we tried first was to create containers at the operating system level, right? So if you're a Windows user, you might be familiar with tools like uh, Hyper-V that allows you to run Linux inside Windows. Or you know, if you're a Mac user, Parallels allows you to run Windows inside, um, uh, yeah, OS X, and um, you know, you you can basically create these abstractions at the operating system level, which happens to be heavyweight. Uh, what containers do and what Kubernetes does, it they have a thinner abstraction layer with a shared host operating system, so it basically ends up being faster, and you can host many more many more applications in a single computer. So, you know, this, I know this is a lot, but hopefully this gives you a sense of why using multiple computers is interesting and what are the kind of things that you need to do once you start thinking about having multiple computers to do a task and how to share them with, to you to be used with multiple purposes. So one, one last topic that I want to mention is so what are what are the good frameworks to do distributed computing today? 
And one way of thinking of this is to take a look at some of the most common problems that you face when you're doing distributed computing. And one of such problems is sorting data, right? Basically meaning if you have a list of names and they're not in alphabetical order, you know, it's pretty common to want to have the data listed in alphabetical terms. And, you know, this doesn't apply just to names, it applies to numbers, it applies to structures and why not. So it's very common, common to have a set of data, you know, that could be a movie rendering or whatever, and want to know what is the first thing that is in front of the camera or which is the most relevant web page. Uh, so there happens to be a benchmark of sorting in distributed, uh, at distributed networks at scale, basically, with cluster computing. And it's called the sort ben benchmark homepage. And you can see here, like, you know, year over year, like uh, researchers and, you know, uh, companies compete to actually create a reasonable and better uh, sorting systems that you can share with others. You can, you can look at the past winners, winners and you're going to see here uh, technologies listed like Hadoop that, uh, you know, we didn't mention explicitly, but MapReduce was an open source was implemented in an open source project called Hadoop, Hadoop Map Reduce and the Hadoop file system. Uh, this was a few years ago. If you look at more recent kind of, um, you know, uh, benchmarks, you can see, for instance, the one in 2016, uh, NatSort um, has a research paper of how they were able to accomplish this. And you can, you can get a sense of what are the things, what are the tools that people use today for doing large scale computing. Um, so for instance, here in the overview, they're mentioning, we implemented our system based on the 2014 Databricks sort ber uh, benchmark entry based on Apache Spark. Uh, so what is Apache Spark? So um, in the same way that uh, MapReduce brought a lot of flexibility to producing and creating distributed computing programs that are efficient to write and efficient to execute. Apache Spark is a new project that allows you to do similar things to MapReduce, uh, but also allows you to do them with much more speed and much more flexibility. Uh, more specifically, we can look over the, uh, we can look at the Spark paper, Cluster Computing with uh, Working Sets um, by Matei. Saharia and a few others, Ion Stoica as well from uh, Berkeley. And what this paper mentions, it basically introduces Hadoop as, you know, this, you know the usual, the, the way in which you would usually do batch processing over large data sets, and then proposes uh, Spark, Apache Spark, as a project that can use not just, not just use disk drives, but also make use of in-memory computation to speed up computation. And also with, you know, improvements like a better API, that means, you know, like a easier way of writing programs that run in Spark and several other improvements over Hadoop. Um, one of the ones worth mentioning is, for instance, you can do some modeling on uh, Hadoop and this would be how much time it takes you to do, you know, to run something in Hadoop, which is in the order of a uh, thousand seconds. Over each iter iteration, 2,000 on the 20th iteration and 4,000 seconds on the 30th iteration. And you can see that Apache Spark basically can optimize uh, much more efficiently over, over Hadoop by using, uh, making good use of memory, uh, networking, and having a richer, more simplified API. In fact, you can take a look at the Apache Spark project by going to spark.apache.org and kind of like read what the pitch for Apache Spark is, which reads, uh, Apache, Apache Spark is a unified analytics engine for large scale data processing. Uh, read distributed computing, right? And the things that you can do with Apache Spark are pretty, um, you know, unbounded. You can do pretty much whatever you want with Apache Spark since it's a generic computing engine. So you could use it potentially for rendering 3D movies or, you know, for creating a search engine or why not. Um, but there's there's a few core libraries that Apache Spark highlights. This is probably going to be a topic for a different video where 
I would want to introduce you to how to install Apache Spark locally and also do uh, distributed computing with proper Apache Spark clusters, uh, most likely using um, the R programming language. All right, well, thank you so much. I hope this gave you like a brief overview of why using more than one computer is interesting, what, dist what distributed computing means, what are the challenges, what were the frameworks that were popular and that are currently, currently popular. And again, we'll uh, see each other soon.